Hello. Hello. Kailua Church. Kailua Church. Kailua. 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 Here, show the shaka. Say, whole bra, how's it? How's it? Whole bra, how's it? Say, miss you guys. I miss you guys. We're going to send this to uh, Kailua Church. Why? Because. Do you miss them? Yeah. What color was the church? Uh, um, blue. Blue? Mm hmm No, it was white. No, blue. All right. Well, he might be colorblind like me. But like reverse colorblind, I guess, where therefore you add color to non-color-based objects. I don't know. Anyways, all right. Say aloha. Aloha. Wave. Hello. Whew. I believe I'm safe to take this off around you. If you feel uncomfortable during this video, you may wear yours. Um, I want to thank uh, Auntie Dye for sending us these. This is not product placement, but I do want to thank you for sending these masks. They're better than the Amish ones we have here. So, um, yeah, I'm excited to talk to you guys. Um, I just want to give you guys a family update. We obviously miss and love all of you guys. And, um, but yeah, I'll give you a family update. So, uh, the Rachel has been continuing to work as an Amish driver. She drives Amish to their location so that they can work. It's a long drive. So she is a courier of Amish people, which I, I think is kind of funny. But she's enjoying that and doing well. Um, she, and our kids are growing up. Um, Myron's full-time job is to destroy things in the house. Um, one instance, uh, he actually broke drywall on our wall uh, that was recently drywalled and then ate it. So he continues to destroy what we have built, but we love him. And uh, Moses is getting smarter and therefore trickier, um, or he'll try and find his way into trouble and things like that and then uh, get out of it. So um, having our kids has shown me the true inherited depravity of sin, um, but I love them as God loves us. So uh, that's kind of exciting. They're do both doing well. They're getting bigger, running around. Uh, as for me, I continue to go to school. I'm currently going to two schools, Lancaster Bible College um, and Nazarene Bible College. Uh, one is online and the Lancaster Bible College is the physical campus that I go to. I'm enjoying uh, my classes, um, learning, and I'm pursuing my degree in Bible and theology. And right now I'm on track to graduate, uh, not this May, but next May, so a little over a year. Um, and I'll have my degree. So anyways, that's us in a, in a nutshell. And, um, yeah, I'll begin, uh, I'll show you a video of the two boys real quick. Uh, Let me see. Show me your tattoo. Nice. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Who's that tattoo look like? Uncle Jared's. But what is it instead? It's a drink. It's a crying smoothie because because nobody drank him. Oh, well, there you go. Now <laughs> you drinking him, making him feel better. I'm intending. I eat. I eat on a smoothie. All right, so that's just a little bit of us having some fun during this quarantine time. Um, but yeah, uh, before I get into what we're going to talk about today, uh, let's open up with some prayer. Uh, dear Lord, I just uh, thank you for this opportunity that I have to speak uh, from your word. I thank you for the uh, just the, the constant pursuit of your spirit in our lives to continually transform us and sanctify us and make us into the image of your son, Lord. I thank you for your mercy, uh, which we can't even grasp. Uh, just how infinite it is and how renewing it is. May we rest in that, but at the same time, Lord, understand our co-laborship that we have with you on this pursuit of sanctification. And um, 
just working and eradicating the sins and strongholds in our life through the power of your spirit at work in our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, what I want to talk about today is kind of really centralized around uh, a question. And uh, this question can go a couple of different ways, but I'll, I'll stay focused on it. And that question really is, if I have habitual sin or sin that's reoccurring in my life uh, as a Christian, and am I still a Christian or am I still saved? And uh, this question can kind of run along the lines of the sanctification process and our view of that process, but also can we have assurance in our salvation? Especially when there is sin that keeps reoccurring and we sometimes feel it as maybe shame comes on or we aren't sincere when we come to repentance. And so the verse that I, I'm going to look at that I think a lot of people when they're reading the word will stop at. Um, I'll, there's a couple, but I'll just show you the one that I think is, is a strong um, verse that speaks to this is uh, Hebrews 10:26. It says, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. Now, when, uh, when we read verses, uh, there needs to be good biblical hermeneutics to it. And what I mean by that is that when we just take a verse or proof text out um, and just look at it in its singular structure we don't get the full picture or the full message sometimes and so uh when we just look at this verse and and i've even just seen it on my bible app pop up one time and i've heard other people use it in conversation when we talked about oh i know that my sin is wrong because scripture and the law has revealed that my sin is wrong but then i did that sin is christ's sacrifice not sufficient for that sin because I knew the sin that I was doing was wrong. And so um, what, what we need to think about this verse is look at the broader context and really what was being spoken. So in this, uh, in this uh, epistle to the Hebrews, if we back up a little bit, we can see that this line was for people that disregarded the gospel. So these are Judaizers, people that are reverting from the truth and knowledge of what Christ did, they're basically going against the gospel. So uh, it's you understand who Christ is, you see him as the Messiah, you realize all that, that knowledge of truth of the gospel, and that the only way for your sins to be atoned for is through faith in Christ and the work he did on the cross. And you go away from that, and you're walking away from that. And specifically, because this is to a Hebrew Jewish context, you're leaving the gospel and moving into the law, uh, the old Hebrew law, the old Jewish ways. And uh, Christ came to fulfill those Jewish ways. Um, he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. But the law and the prophets was intended to show us that we needed a Savior, that we needed Christ. So to go back to a system, a sacrificial system that does not fully cover or atone for our sins, then we're going into a system where the sacrifice does not work. That the only sacrifice is in the truth of Christ and what he has done. We need to put our faith and trust in that. And so it's in that that we are saved. So the distinction here is not saying that I, have, I know about God, um, I know about Christ, and I have this knowledge, and then I sin again. Is is therefore that sin not saved then? No, it's this is a different context in it, and he's writing specifically for a different group of people that are saying, instead, they're saying this, that like, I've heard the gospel, I realize or I recognize that Jesus is the Messiah, but I'm not going to walk in that way. So it's a distinction between the rejection of the gospel and not necessarily just a sin inside of knowing that my sin is wrong. So in order to progress from that, I think we need to really have a healthy understanding of what repentance is. Um, and so 
when we understand what repentance is, then we can kind of understand this process and how it kind of takes place on our walk or our progression of sanctification. And um, so what I want to talk about next is Paul Washer states this. He's a preacher and evangelical preacher. He talks about this and he says this in regards to repentance. He says that many Christians have either a superficial view of repentance, that they never have troubled, have a troubled soul, or that they have a severe view of repentance, um, that they are troubled all the time. And so basically he's giving you two parts or two spectrums of repentance. That is an unhealthy view. We need to be land in the middle. And this unhealthy view is that uh, you might think of it more of a, of a Calvinistic uh, approach where it's once saved, always saved. That's an unhealthy view of Calvinism where you're just saying, I can continue to sin. And um, I, I know the Lord just has to forgive me or that I'm saved. And so therefore he is forgiving me. And then there's no level of actual uh, remorse in the soul. And then the other side can be more on the Arminian side, which is that you can lose uh, the idea of that uh, it's free will and you can move in and out. You can lose your salvation. But resting so heavy on the side of losing salvation that you can't rest in the assurances of your salvation. So you're talking about you're resting so much on this idea that you're always troubled all the time that you lost your salvation, that Christ just came and quickly took it away, and you don't understand the work of the continuing work of God and how the Holy Spirit continues to work in us. Um, so there's this spectrum where we need to land right in the middle. And so I want to look here at, this is a, from Christianity.org, I believe has a great definition of repentance. It says, repentance is the act of regretting sincerely the sin in your past with the goal to never do it again, it is making a decision to turn away from evil and to serve God. Repentance is one of the requirements for the forgiveness of sins. So it, it, it's really twofold. And we need to rest in that 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 tension between the two. Uh, it, we need to realize that it, there is true remorse. There is the, when the Holy Spirit comes and he starts to, to show us our sin. And after we have committed that sin, that we have a real uh, internal remorse. That we, are, we feel bad about it. That we know it was against God's laws. And that um, it, we feel grieved about it, really. The second is, since it's twofold, is that this activity or this moral compromise that we did, this sin, uh, that we don't try and justify it um, as something that's acceptable in the light of God's holiness and scripture, but now we move into action. That we not only feel bad about this sin, but that we actively turn. Uh, the idea of repentance is to turn away from evil. That we we are now moving in the direction of God. So uh, one way we can think of it is, is if you think of a linear, you have a line, and there's basically an arrow. This arrow is either pointing one or two directions. It's not a dot. It's not stagnant. We are either moving towards or going towards the process of moving away or going towards the process of sanctification. So when we repent, it's not that we just feel bad and we stay faced this way and can just keep continuing and trying. It's that we make an about face and we go the other direction towards holiness. Now, one thing I want to say is sometimes I think that we think when we repent that we have to make a giant step into ultimate Christian perfection right there. Um, the idea is that we are turning and we are actively saying in our minds and hearts, uh, after the remorse, that we are going to strive to do what God's word says. We are not actively pursuing this sin. doesn't mean we're not going to fall into it again, but it means that we are turned towards the Lord and that we're going in that direction. And so then if we do walk in that direction towards holiness in the matter in which we have messed up and we fall into it again, we need to do the same thing again. We need to live a life of repentance, one where we recognize and we allow the Holy Spirit to come in and say, convict us of our sins and our wrongdoings, and then to allow the Holy Spirit to come in and through God's Spirit to co-labor, 
to work with the Spirit of God in our lives, in our hearts, to change. And so it's it, it, it's a, it's a practical, but it's something that we can't do on our own, but at the same time, it requires a response from us. And I love the way C.S. Lewis puts it in Mere Christianity. He says that every time you make a choice, you're turning the central part of you, the part of you that chooses, into something a little different than it was before. And taking your life as a whole, with all your innumerable innumerable choices, sorry, all of your life long, you are slowly turning this central thing into a heavenly creature or a hellish creature, either into a creature that is in harmony with God and with other creatures and with itself, or else into one that is in a state of war and hatred with God and with its fellow creatures and with itself to be the one kind of creature is heaven, that is, it is joy and peace and knowledge and power. To be the other means madness, horror, idiocy, rage, impotence, and internal loneliness. Each of us at each moment is progressing to the one state of the other. And so it, this idea that we are either moving along in one direction. Um, so one another kind of sub-question that can then come from that is, that we can feel, or at least I know I've felt, is that, okay, we've repented, and we have true, sincere repentance, yet um, we, we, the enemy really likes to come in here and almost whisper about God's mercy, that God's mercy can't forgive us again for the same sin, uh, that how can we truly be sincere in this repentance, and God's not going to forgive us this time. And these are just some thoughts. I mean, I know that I've personally had uh, when I've fallen back into a sin that I know is a sin that I've repented for, that I've asked for forgiveness, that I've turned away from, yet I moved back in that direction. And then I'm sitting there and, and as Paul writes, I hate the things that I do and I do the things that I hate. There's that internal turmoil that's still there. Um and so then sometimes the enemy wants to come in and, and make you question then, is God then going to keep forgiving the sins that I keep repeating? Which kind of goes back to our, our main verse that we're looking at in Hebrews is, I know the truth of my sin. And so therefore, is there no more sacrifice for the same sin that I keep repeating? And, and, that, and, that's, and that's false. And the enemy wants us to doubt the mercy of God. Um, I just think of Peter uh, when he has that uh, encounter with Christ or dialogue with Christ where he talks about the mercy of God. And he says, how many times should I forgive? And this is found in Matthew 18. I'm just going to paraphrase it. But that um, the mercy of God, you know, and he comes in and he tells Jesus. And he's like, should I forgive seven times thinking he is uh, being very merciful as Peter always thought high of himself. Um, but then Jesus says, no, seven times 70, you know, and so this idea that we're, there's this immense amount of forgiveness from God and mercy if the repentance is truly there. And so I think we need to remember that God's mercy and his repentance is going to take place if we come uh, with that true repentance. And so we can have, uh, we can have, uh, you know, faith in God's word and his promises uh, that they are true. So to really sum up this portion of repentance, uh, I just want to say true repentance is that we're standing on the truth of what God claims, that his son sacrificed the atoning blood of Christ is um, at work when we truly repent. And that uh, the part of repentance is that not only do we have that internal remorse, but we're making a different direction change in our life. We're turning away from that pursuit and now pursuing what God calls us to in these areas. So if that's um, the, just a, a, any sin really, so like if that's, if that's lying um, and you know lying is wrong and you've been doing it, it's saying, okay, I realize that this is wrong. Lord, please forgive me. Then trying not to lie or asking for forgiveness for someone that you lied to. Uh, however that looks. And so it's that idea that there is an action that uh, goes forth from it. And so I just want to give two verses right here that really 
show the, the process of repentance, and that's Acts 3.19, where it says, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of ref refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord when repentance comes. And the second is Romans 8. One I just want to talk about is, therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, just that that's so powerful that there's no condemnation when we are resting in that truth of what Christ did. So we're resting in the knowledge and the claims that God gives in his scripture for that repentance. So um, the, the next step is, so what can we do? Um, we, we looked at um, what scripture says. We looked at what repentance is. Um, we looked at the mercy of God, that we can hold true to his mercy and that he will forgive if we are sincere in our repentance. Um, the idea that repentance is not just, uh, oh, I kind of feel bad about that, but it's also ingrained the twofold step of us turning towards the Lord and walking then in that direction. So what are some things that we can do in our lives to help mitigate and to work with the Spirit of God to eradicate these habitual sins in our life. And so I want to look just briefly at some biblical principles uh, that we can apply and that uh, Christ exemplified uh, during his time here on earth and what we can add into our lives. Um, and the first one I want to look at is confession. Uh, Confession is the, the, the beginning steps leading into repentance um, and is a significant part of repentance. So um, I'm going to look at uh, 1 John. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all righteousness. The first part is if we, uh, um, if we confess our sins, this is what follows. He is faithful. And just, and so he's talking about those promises we talked about to purify us from our sin, to alleviate us of that um, through the blood of Christ. But the first part is if we, so we have to decide to confess our sins and not hold on to them and not bury them. This is what the enemy wants. The enemy wants us to stay in that state of, you know, you're not going to be forgiven for these sins. Um, how can God use you as you continue to sin? You're not on a path of sanctification. Are you really saved? These are the questions the enemy wants us when we're alone and, and when we're, we're thinking and hearing these, um, the, the scripture and stuff. We, he, he wants to try and get in there and do that to us. And that, that's not the truth. God's scripture is clear that if we confess, he is going to be faithful to forgive our sins. Um, and so that's a true confession. Um, so then I want to also talk a little bit about what scripture also says about when we do hold on to those confessions and how we feel. Because um, there's been times where I've held back confession either because I didn't want to confess to the person uh, of my wrongdoing or that I kind of believe that lie that, Lord, how can you use me? I've done this sin again. Uh, I feel such shame. I'm not worthy of your gospel, which in a sense is true. We feel unworthy. It brings out the glory of what Christ did on the cross and how we need him. And it shows more, but at the same time, it's holding me back from confession. And I felt the way these verses felt. And so the first one I'm going to read to you is Psalm 32, three. Um, it says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. The keeping silent isn't like, hey, I'm not professing the word of God. It's a silence of not confessing to God, not walking to the Lord or doing or coming to him. And we kept silent and he, he's just his bones wasted away. And there's kind of this groaning and this internal turmoil that rested in. The second that I want to look at is Proverbs 28, 13. It says, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. And uh, I, I mean, I just know it to be true when I confess my sins, when I pray with my accountability partner, when I um, come to the Lord and say, I've messed up. I recognize it. Please forgive me again. I, I want to walk in your ways. I want to pursue a life of holiness, Lord. Um, 
something changes, something comes in. It, it's because I'm finding the mercy of God and the mercy comes um, into my life again. The second is to utilize the tools uh, Christ and God and scripture gives us and instructs us to use. Um, so very simple. I'll just go over some, just uh, two of these tools real quick that are just real practical, real simple. And the first is scripture. It's getting into God's word. It's also when you start to meditate on the truths of God and you have faith in those truths, you know what God says and what he will do. You can rest in those and not believe the lies of the enemy. Um, not only that is I, I want to read it. I mean, it pretty much says it straightforward. It's Second Timothy three sixteen through seventeen. It says, "All Scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work." Um, I think sometimes we can just go to that. Oh, it's just a teaching and rebuking um, one. But it's also for training up in righteousness. So that's training you up. That's on your walk uh, and process of sanctification. That's edifying you. That's bringing you up and training you in the righteous ways of the Lord. And then that way we can be equipped for every good work. Not only to go out and share the word of God, but that we can also continue to pursue a life of holiness and allow God to come in and forgive us and walk in the right direction. Uh, the second is prayer um jeremiah 29 12 says then you will call on me and come and pray to me and i will listen to you um and if we just look at the life of christ and how many times he left to be by himself and to pray yes prayer is corporate and i'll get to the corporate aspect of uh what god calls us to but there is a there is a personal aspect and that we need to personally pray and we need to um have those quiet times and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us and to lay his finger on areas in our lives that we do need to repent and to continue to walk in. Um, so prayer is vital uh, to our walk. And especially if we want to stay true and continue uh, to walk in the process of sanctification. When we leave these key elements out of our lives, we're missing uh, just uh, powerful tools that God gives us. And necessary tools. So this comes into my my uh, my third uh, point, which is the body of Christ, which is the corporate church and the brothers and sisters uh, in the body of Christ that God gives us to help us in this process. Um, and uh, I have a professor uh, that I at my school. His name's Doug Finkbeiner, but I love what he says. He says our faith is personal, but never private. Um, and we were looking at this when we were studying the book of Acts and the formation of uh, the start of the church. And I just loved how he said that, that yes, it's, it's personal, but it's never private. There is a corporate element um, to the body of Christ that we all need to engage in. And one of the very effective ways in this process of habitual sin that I believe is very effective in the church is one, the prayer. So I'll read real quick. James 5.16 It says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. <clears throat> so there's that corporate prayer that's uh, having the body of Christ using its gifts to edify the whole body. And when we're just by ourselves um, and we're holding into all these issues and these struggles and we keep falling into them again and again. We're not utilizing what God has placed there. Now, I'm not necessarily saying go out and blast your sins and your struggles all over the Internet. Uh, but I am saying there there is an importance of sharing with faithful and wise, steadfast Christians to come around you, to pray with you, to walk with you in this journey and to help you walk that path. Um, you know, I love all of the Pauline letters or, or any of the, the things he writes because it's a practical theology. He not only tells them um, what God's word said, how we're supposed to move into that, uh, what Christ did, but he also gives a practical theology. He's, it's very practical. There's things that we can actually do. And I believe uh, actively being a part of our the community of Christ 
and allowing that community to help us and to walk with us because we each have different gifts in order to pour in. And so when we use those other people's gifts, we are working um, in the way Christ sees the church. And so that can be an accountability group, small group. But uh, specifically, I want to talk a little bit about accountability partners. Um, I know for me and my walk, one of the greatest uh, growths uh, in the process of sanctification for me, um, practical wise, has been to have an accountability partner or a group of uh, specifically for me men that uh, I can confess my struggles things that I think you don't just come to church on Sunday morning, you sit next and during grace time and you're like, yeah, hey, you know, uh, I'm struggling with this. How are you? You know what I mean? That That's, uh, there's something special about having an accountability group and then sharing those struggles and lifting each other up in prayer, holding each other accountable, um, confessing that sin and challenging the person um, weekly or however you set it up. So John Wesley says, know your... We must know our disease and our cure. And what he's saying is, I think we're all susceptible to uh, to to different sins. Not saying that we can't sin a different sin, but my my natural tendencies uh, for me, I'll just say one is is alcohol. I stay away from alcohol. The reason I stay away from alcohol is uh, because I don't have a good track record with it, and I know that it leads me down a road where I will sin. I will. I don't have self control. So it's putting up logical boundaries and then also sharing those struggles uh, with other people and then coming beside you to, uh, to pray and to hold each other accountable. Um, the last part I want to incorporate in this um, is the idea of uh, complacency. So I know uh, some areas in my walk, I feel like I may have control over this habitual sin or you might be doing good or whatever's and then you fall back into it and that can be uh i know i found for me is complacency so uh one thing i i remember from the marine corps is there's a sign that's uh outside of our fob as we would exit um and our fob is just like our little base our forward operating base and it just said complacency kills and uh it said it three times um, as you were going out and the idea that when we think we're safe or that we're walking, um, you know, that we're doing good, uh, that that's one when the enemy strikes. Uh, so one example of this, I just want to look at first Peter five, eight, uh, it talks about Satan and it says, be alert and so, and of sober mind, your enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour uh, the idea that our enemy's out there and he's constantly looking uh, for a weak spot and to attack us that um we we must just not get uh too reassured that um just because we have conquered a sin in our life or that we haven't seen it come up doesn't mean that we're not susceptible anymore to that sin or um yeah so really it's you know and that can that can that complacency can start by cutting out your devotion time, uh, not praying anymore, thinking you're okay to go into scenarios. Uh, so for me, I really don't go, I don't go to bars or like, I don't know, one, I just don't have a fun anyways, hanging out in the spaces anymore because I've been changed. Uh, but the idea that um, you, you're set up boundaries, practical boundaries, and you, you don't ever think that you have fully conquered that sin, that it can't come back and creep into your life. Um, so it's constantly uh, knowing that you need to, to utilize those tools that God gives us to rely on his spirit and to follow its leading um, when those sins approach um, and to choose God's way instead of uh, the temptation. And so uh, we want to remember not to get complacent and to uh, stay true to what God calls us to. And um, so I, I want this to, to be an encouragement uh, and a challenge to us. So the encouragement is that we can, we can look at the work of Christ in our lives through that initial uh, salvation, 
So I don't want to take away from that either, that, that initial first step into the journey of Christ. And so like for me, I know that before I would do these sins that I now know, and there's been a difference. Um, when I would do them before, I wouldn't even regard them as sin. Uh, there was no remorse in my heart for them. Um, I didn't even have basically a compass that was pointing me to, hey, maybe I should repent from this. There, there was none of that. And when I came to s salvation in Christ, in the initial uh, part of my salvation, my life was radically changed. There were some things that I dropped almost immediately, but um, there was now this, the Holy Spirit's presence in my life showing me and prompting me to uh, seek holiness and to seek repentance in certain areas of my life. And this is a process and, it, and uh, it can look different for everyone, but that initial start um, is there. And so um, that, that's encouraging that now we have uh, the Holy Spirit with us as we're walking in step in our salvation through the process of sanctification. Uh, so, but there's also a difference between that and apostating, which means to reject the gospel. Like we looked at the original verse in Hebrews 10, um, that, you know, it, that context is saying, I no longer put my faith and trust in the work of Christ. Whereas I put my faith and trust in the work of Christ, I've made a mistake and I'm repenting from that and confessing not losing my salvation, but not doing the will of God or walking in what the Lord has called me to or the best, but uh, repenting and turning back on that path. And so the challenge I want to put forth is that while we're each on this journey in this process of sanctification through that initial true faith uh, that I talked about, is that we need to put our hands to the plow and uh, allow the transformative work of God's Spirit to come into our lives, to ignore the uh, and to fight against the, the what the enemy puts in our minds, that God can't forgive us again, that, his, that we've run his mercy out. Um, these are all lies um, that you're never going to be free of this. That's another thing. You well, might as well just keep sinning this habitual sin because I'm never going to break free of it. And you just feel like that. You know, we got to trust in the word of God that says the Holy Spirit can work in us and bring us into a perfecting work of Christ. Um, but it also takes us being obedient to the Holy Spirit and to God's word. And so we need to have this balance of work, um, Christ's work in our heart and our responsibility to respond as well. And by responding, we can utilize the tools that God gives us with scripture, um, prayer, and using the body of Christ um, to to help us walk this journey. And so um, I just want to challenge that the first part be in this process uh, is confession. And so um, may we all uh, recognize our sins and then confess them and not hold on to them. Because I know in the past holding on to them for me has just kept me in those states where I wasn't uh, fully responding to God's will uh, because I was holding on to something that I wasn't confessing. And um, yeah, that's not good. So don't, we don't want to do that. So I want to pray with us as we close out today. Um, yeah. Dear Lord, I just, uh, I thank you first and foremost for your the act of your son. There is no other way or no other sacrifice that is sufficient besides the death of your son, the atoning work of his blood on the cross that has taken our place, that has paid our price, Lord. And so I thank you for that work. I also thank you for the continued renewing of your mercy day in and day out, Lord, as you are a God that is so merciful May we rest in that truth that you will forgive us if we confess and repent our sins, Lord. I also pray that we have a mindset of victory, Lord, that your scripture is filled with how the Spirit can come in and perfect us, Lord, that the Spirit can come in and, and give us victory over these sins. I pray that we don't lose hope, 
or in uh, what you can accomplish and long to accomplish in our lives, Lord. I pray that we rest in that truth of hope, um, that we allow the Spirit to have free will in our lives, that we open the doors of our lives to the Holy Spirit to come in and say, hey, this is an area that you need to get rid of. Hey, we need to repent from this. And that he convicts us and that not only does he convict us, Lord, but that we walk in that conviction with true repentance, a true remorse, and then a turning away from, Lord, a new direction, a new step uh, on our journey with you. And that we repent from those sins and we walk in step with you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, we love and miss you, and uh, we thank you so much for just the the impact you guys made on our journey and walk as a body of Christ, um, and that is just unmeasurable. So we thank you. Aloha, oi, boy. <laughs>